My name is Nathan Hensley. Um, I'm assistant professor of English um, here at Georgetown and director of this year's uh, Lannan Symposium in Nature's Wake, the Art and Politics of Environmental Crisis. It's an incredible honor and a humbling one to stand here with the task of introducing our speaker tonight. There are many people in this room much better suited to the task. Visual artists and poets whose careers, as we saw yesterday, have been dedicated to reimagining our relation to the natural world. Scholars working to think historically about ecological living and to model in their work how we as individuals and as a society might be otherwise. We learned yesterday, or I did anyways, at lunch, that Winona LaDuke knew Bill McKibben during their undergraduate years and I thought it was fun to think of two future titans of the environmental movement hashing it out as college kids, both of them, as Winona said, quote, very nerdy types. There are also many activists in this room, a good number of them students, who have in mass movements and direct actions courageously arrayed their, arrayed their own bodies against our allegedly inevitable climate disaster people who've lived the Jesuit maxim of work in service for others by risking something of their own to stand against the environmental violence that affects us all. Thanks to you all for being here tonight. So I stand here very humbly to offer thanks and to perform the redundant task of introducing you to the most visible and effective environmental activist we have. I'll start with a thanks. As I suspect we'll hear more about shortly, there are at least two ways to get something big accomplished with money and with people. In this official introduction, I would like to recognize both. An event like this cannot happen without significant expend expenditure and investment from many parties, and I'd like to acknowledge here the groups that have provided the material resources to make what have been for me um, an incredible two days possible. Funding for this symposium, as you already know, comes from the, a generous gift from Lannan Foundation and is administered through Lannan Center for Poetics and Social Practice at Georgetown. Significant further support has come from the Georgetown Environmental Initiative and the Department of Art and Art History, in addition to a collective of supporting sponsors and allied units reaching across the arts and sciences. I thank the program in Justice and Peace the Center for Social Justice, the Lecture Fund, the Modernities Working Group, the Native American Student Council, and the Departments of Government, Chemistry, English, and Biology. I gratefully acknowledge these gestures of solidarity. But the second kind of power, the human kind, I'd like to acknowledge here most strongly. The industry and diligence of countless people have made these um, two days of symposium possible. These include Georgetown faculty like Mike Osborne, Evan Reed, Henry Schwartz, Lori Marish, Sam Pinto, Carolyn Forche, Mark McMorris, Dana Luciano, and many others. Georgetown students like Caroline James, Whitney Dockery, and the amazing Elena Noyes who led a dedicated faction of students in huge promotional efforts to get the word out. We saw many of those yesterday and today. They include activists like Nina Sherburn and student organizations like the Georgetown Environmental Leaders, the Native American Student Council, and GU Fossil Free. They include the stunningly gifted speakers themselves and the moderators who've guided us over these two days, and they include you, the audience, the people who've been part of these conversations. Um, all of you have given of yourself so we could gather for these conversations and I wanna thank you all now seriously for your work in that. There's one person um, whose labor though has been by far the most crucial in enabling everything we've seen, heard, and done over the past couple days and that's the stunningly gifted land admi administrator, the sort of prime mover of this thing, Jessica Williams. I'd like to pause here to ask you to recognize her in that. Thank you, Jessica. Thanks. So now it's my task to introduce a person whose place in the struggle for environmental justice is perhaps without equal in our time. As most of you already know, Bill McKibben is the founder of the grassroots climate organization 350.org and with others, organized last fall's People's Climate March when 400,000 people converged on New York to perform for the world the fact 
that the systematic wreckage of the earth was no longer a niche issue. It was in 1989 that McKibben published the work he'll be revisiting for us tonight. As I mentioned, to open the symposium, McKibben's still stunning The End of Nature explained in clear, luminous prose that human beings live in an era when nature, understood as a force or set of systems independent from human activity, no longer exists. We permeate this world and our diligent reorganization of the Earth's atmosphere during the fossil fuel era means that every area of the world, no matter how seemingly pristine, bears the trace of us in its very being. I noted to start the symposium that in 1989, when McKibben announced this news to the world, this year's Georgetown seniors were still five years away from being born. This means that the generation sitting in these seats in this beautiful hall has always lived, as I said last time, in nature's wake. We are sitting with them today and at a moment unique in the history of geological time when we and nature have become forever linked and the future of that relationship remains to be written. There is no one better placed, no one whose work over a period of decades has so forthrightly addressed this key impasse of our time than Bill McKibben. McKibben is the Schumann Distinguished Scholar in Environmental Studies at Middlebury College and a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He has written 12 books on climate change and politics for which he's won a Guggenheim and Lannan Literary Awards, among many other accolades. He's been arrested protesting the Keystone Pipeline. He's created globally scaled collective artworks visible from space and he stood at the forefront of the gathering movement for fossil fuel divestment, an issue of vital concern that because of the committed work of the young activists at GU Fossil Free, who are sitting right here, will the board of trustees at this institution will consider later this spring, a huge thing. McKibben won the Gandhi Peace Award and the Thomas Merton Prize in 2013, the Right Livelihood or Alternative Nobel in 2014, and holds honorary degrees from nearly 20 colleges and universities. Even so unradical a publication as Foreign Policy named him to their list of the world's 100 most important global thinkers, and the Boston Globe said he was probably America's most important environmentalist. We can, I think, drop the probably. It is my profound honor to welcome to the 2015 Lannan Symposium and to Georgetown, Bill McKibben. Please. Well, thank you. That was um, the kindest of introductions. Uh, it left me feeling humble and very old. Um, um, it is an enormous pleasure to be here. It's actually been a, um, a wonderful afternoon, a long day. It began in Phoenix, but um, it was a privilege, a real privilege to spend an hour this afternoon with the, your president here at Georgetown. Um, I meet a lot of administrators and things in the course of time, and he's obviously a, 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 a different sort um, and an interesting and engaged uh, intellect and heart. And the conversation that we had led me a little bit to tear up what I'd been planning to kind of say to you tonight and talk about things a little bit differently. Um, so I, I may stumble a bit here and there, um, um, but but it is, a, um, it is a, a kind of time of reflection for me in a, in a certain way. It's been last year, a quarter century since the end of nature came out. And I no longer do quite what I did then. Um, and what in some ways I would still most like to be doing, which is simply to be leading the, doing the job of a solitary writer uh, uh, of thinking about things and writing them down. Um, that work is extraordinarily important, um, and I'm so glad that there are so many powerful practitioners of it here at the moment. 
And I think that many of those practitioners are also like me, always kind of reevaluating what that work means in the moment of a crisis and in the moment of, um, of a battle. So let me set the scene for a minute first. I I'm well aware that my basic work in life is simply to bum people out mostly, and I, I apologize for that, and I will get through it relatively quickly, but let's set the scene because some basic agreement on the scale and the pace of the problem that we face informs the necessary scale and the pace of the solution. When I wrote The End of Nature in 1989, we knew that we faced a problem. We knew that when you burn coal and gas and oil, you put carbon in the atmosphere. We knew its molecular structure trapped heat. We knew the planet would warm. We did not know uh, how fast, and we didn't know how hard it would bite, and the last quarter century has been an exercise in finding out that it's happening faster and biting harder than we would ever have suspected. Uh, Science has done its job and done it well. It has offered a profound warning in time um, and with vigor. Um, it's been amazing to watch the scientific community, the world's chemists and atmospheric physicists and things come together in basic agreement about the problem that we face. But even they have consistently understated the danger that we find ourselves in simply because by their nature scientists are conservative. If you had told anybody working on this issue a quarter century ago that in 25 years we would have lost most of the summer sea ice in the Arctic, they would have said no, that's 50, 75 years too early. Um, it'll take longer than that. If you had told anybody a quarter century ago if you'd shown them the paper that came out this time last year showing that in the Antarctic, the great West Antarctic ice sheet had come unmoored from underneath, uh, that warm water was eating it away and ungrounding it and leading to what looks like now it's an irreversible slow slide into the ocean, people would have said no, that will take longer than that to happen, much longer. We hoped that the Antarctic was stable on a on a time frame of centuries. If you had told someone a quarter century ago the pH of the oceans would be 30 percent more acidic, uh, uh, they would have looked at you um, blankly because no one had even bothered to study the question of whether or not the ocean chemistry, the chemistry of the oceans that cover three quarters of the surface of our home planet uh, that that chemistry could be disrupted. It seemed too vast for change on any real scale, but no. Uh, the excess carbon in the atmosphere, some of it is absorbed in that water, and so already we see great effect. If someone had said that we would see the kind of changes in hydrological cycles, the way that water moves around the planet, people would have said, yes, that's possible, but probably it won't be totally visible for a while. It's unfortunately utterly visible now, many places on Earth, every single passing day. Today, as we meet, the um, Chileans have announced a state of red alert, a, a, a fire alert across uh, the country. The years of drought have reached the point there where the um, great national parks, several of them are ablaze, and those thousand-year-old monkey puzzle trees, some of the most amazing trees on the planet in danger of burning if you move south to Brazil, Sao Paulo in the middle of a drought so deep that people are drilling holes through the concrete in their basement trying to find groundwater. If you move north into California, if you go to the country where Bob Haas or Rebecca Solnit or how you know make their lives always the place in this country of the great promise, um, the beautiful verdant west, the place where you know um, the Okies streamed in an effort to 
escaped the drought that afflicted them. Now a drought deeper than one that we've ever measured there. Um, the snowpack in the Sierra is at 12% of normal right now. The snowpack in the Olympics at 8% of normal. Um, these are things that the computer models told us would happen. They're just happening fast, fast, so fast. With each year and with each month, we seem to set new records. Um, it's been, as of last month, 30 years since we had a month on this planet that was cooler than the long-term average, the average over the course of humans. It's been 30 years. Anybody under the age of 30, most of the people in this room have never known what we thought of as the normal climatic system that dominated this planet, that held it in its embrace for the 10,000 years that we call the Holocene, the 10,000 year period of benign climatic stability that coincided not coincidentally with the rise of human civilization, the most important thing that happened in the lifetime of everybody in this room is that we left behind the Holocene and moved into something else. And that's what I was trying to get at when the kind of philosophical sections of the end of nature, that there was no longer the world that we had always imagined, that we'd altered it in such fundamental ways that our impact had no edge anymore. And in years since, the scientists have taken that notion and um, given it a name. They say that as we leave the Holocene, we enter the Anthropocene, the world made by man. Um, the scariest part of all of this is that what I've described is what happens when you raise the temperature of the earth about one degree Celsius. We're on a path at the moment on current trajectories of fossil fuel use to raise the temperature of this planet more like four degrees in the course of this century. And if we do that, if we allow that to happen, then we cannot have a planet anything like the one that human beings, human civilizations grew up on. We can't have those kind of civilizations. Already we start to strain. Already we begin to wonder uh, about our agriculture, say, when the most productive parts of it in places like California are struggling to find the water that is essential already. We struggle, but the agronomists tell us that from this point on, we can expect each degree increase in global average temperature to cut grain yields on this earth about 10%. So do the math in your own head. Um, um, we raise the temperature three degrees, we cut the number of calories on earth by a third. Then what happens to war and peace, to development, to public health, to women's rights, to all the things that those are not possible? on a planet deteriorating that fast. Science has provided us with the mathematical contours to understand our plight. And I, I wrote some about these a, a couple of years ago. Um, uh, a piece called The Terrifying New Math of Global Warming. And at the time, it was pretty new provided by some financial analysts in London who had gone to the trouble of studying financial reports of the fossil fuel industry. And uh, uh, what they found was that they had in their reserves at the moment of coal and oil and gas nigh on to 3,000 gigatons of carbon already identified. That's what they've said they're going to dig up and burn. And the problem is that the scientists have told us that we have buffer space for perhaps 500 gigatons more if we're going to stay below two degrees Celsius, the, the absolute red line, the one red line the world has drawn. 
So what science in essence has told us, what that math has told us, is that we basically need, require at this point, a fossil freeze, an end to the new development of fossil fuel, that we have to leave almost everything that we know about underground, and we dare not go look for any more at all. Um, um, that there is enormous danger, that there is no way to preserve the planet's climate on our current course. That we have that warning in those kind of explicit numbers from our scientific community is a great gift. They have done their job. And it is only at this moment in history that we could ever have gotten that gift if it was 100 years ago that we had passed this barrier, if it had taken only that much carbon in the atmosphere, um, we never would have known about it because we didn't have the satellites and the computer programs and the other things that were required to issue this warning. But we do. Thanks to human ingenuity, we've been given the greatest treasure there could ever be, a glimpse into the future, that forewarning of what was to come. Not only that, not only have the scientists done their job, the other important fact to know about this world, the other thing to kind of have in your head to allow you to understand where we sit, is that the engineers have done their job too, with real power. In, in 25 years ago, when we talked about solar energy, we did it with our fingers crossed, you know. It was something to hope for in the future. It wasn't, it was, you know, there were a few people with solar panels on their roofs, but these were, you know, um, um, aging hippies down in the basement tinkering with their array of lead acid batteries. This was not ready for prime time. Thank God they did that work, and thank God that others have built on it, and it has been unbelievable to see what human ingenuity can do. The price of a solar panel has fallen 98% in the last 40 years. It's fallen 75% in the last six years. Deutsche Bank said the other day it should fall 40% more in the next three years. That fact alone gives us, well, it gives us a way out. It offers some door out of this horrible place into which we've found ourselves. And you can get some sense of the possibility when you look at the few places that have even tried to do anything about it. The one great example, really, the one big country that's tried is Germany. And there were days last summer when the Germans generated 80% of the power they used from solar panels within their borders. There's some irony of history here. I mean, the Germans caused more than their share of problems in the 20th century, okay? Uh, it's sweetly appropriate that they're providing more than their share of solutions as this century dawns, but it's not because they have such a great surplus of sunlight. When you look at the maps of insulation, the Germans are about on a par with Alaska. That makes it extraordinarily good news that they've been able to do what they've been able to do. Because think what a country that had, say, oh, I don't know, Florida, Texas, New Mexico, California, Utah, Arizona, uh, could do if it set its mind to it. The engineers allow us to imagine if the scientists tell us that we need a fossil freeze, the engineers allow us to imagine a, a solar thaw and also wind power and the other things that come quickly with it. But to imagine a solar thaw, to imagine in the process of doing that, not just a world that might be able to keep from going over the brink, but also a world that might work in many ways much more beautifully than the one we live on now. Um, think about what it would mean to the balances of power, um, the stores of wealth and power in this world, if we were able to replace um, reliance on fossil fuel 
which always adheres great wealth and power to the tiny number of people who happen to live on top of or control those small deposits of coal and gas and oil, think if that was spread out to the world at large because the sun and the wind are omnipresent, if diffuse. That's the beginning of a different kind of world, one that at least potentially depending on who owned them and things, could work much more democratically than the one we inhabit now. So there is real possibility here, a glimmer of possibility. The horrifying thing, given that glimmer, is to see how little we are doing, given that maybe an ember is the right um, message, uh, the right image, to see how little we are doing to, to blow it into life, to make it spark, to make it spread, to make it blaze, to make it blow up into something big enough to light the world. Um, instead, we have some of the most powerful people in our country, in our world, trying desperately to blow out that ember, to pour water on it, to, to put it out before it can endanger their wealth and their power. Um, sometimes with just almost hideous uh, irony. This week, we watched the governor of the state of Florida, Rick Scott, uh, apparently tell all the scientists in his state that they were not allowed to even use the words climate change or global warming. Um, in a state that is likely to lose large sections of its landmass in the course of the next decades, a place as vulnerable as any on our continent. I've just come from Arizona, from the Valley of the Sun um, 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 in Phoenix, where the local utilities have in the last few months made it essentially impossible for people to put solar panels on their roof. Why? Because, and this is the thing it took me so long to realize, but the thing that's so important, I think, because this battle isn't about the science and the engineering. We won the argument a long time ago, 15 or 20 years ago, we won the argument. We've just lost the fight because the fight's not about reason. The fight is about, as fights usually are, power. And there is immense power on the other side. Okay? The other side is the richest industry in the history of human enterprise. It's made more money for more time than anybody else, and hence it controls more political levers. It has more strength than any other industry. So, so, the good news is that it's clear. It's clear what has to be done, it's clear what can be done, and it is clear what is standing in the way who the other side is. And those are the necessary ingredients for having a battle, which is what we are now starting to have. And we've, I think, got to think about it in those terms or else we fool ourselves and go off down paths that will take us places that will take too long to get where we need to go. Now, it wouldn't necessarily be that way if physics worked a little bit differently, you know? If we had 50 or 100 years to deal with this, then there would be a different set of images in our minds, okay? Um, 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 then we could change much more evolutionarily the way that it's much better for humans and their institutions to change. It's better if we can change slowly, you know, and your generation of incredible young people put solar panels on your roof and, you know, then you're, you know, new brother-in-law comes over and sees him at Thanksgiving and he, you know, buys an electric car and, you know, eventually we get someplace and, and, and so on. But that's not one of the possibilities. Physics isn't giving us that kind of time. And so we don't get that easy evolutionary, evolutionary change we get if we get anything 
the difficult change that is won by winning power. And for that power to be won, we need the set of weapons that works to our advantage. We can't win it with money because they have way more of it than we do. Okay? They have more money than anybody. They have, I'm aware I'm merely a Methodist here at an eminent Jesuit institution, but in my belief, they have more money than God, okay? So, so um, um, that would be the wrong weapon to choose. Our weapons have to be the other ones. Passion, spirit, creativity are our bodies. And when we talk about that, we get right to this place that the Lannan Foundation has brought us here to think about, the role of the imagination in these fights, the role of human creativity. I'm so grateful to the Lannans for all that they do, including this at a crucial time in my life. They supported my work in ways that were uh, of great value. And so I take very seriously these questions that have been raised. In a time when there is a pitched battle, maybe the most important pitched battle in human history underway, the role of the imagination, the things that we do, seem to me a little bit different than at other times. At least that's how it seems to me. I don't, for the moment, write the kind of things so much that I used to write, you know? I miss the kind of chance to um, think deeply and slowly and philosophically about a lot of things. And I would like very much to get back to it. But for the moment, it seems to me, and I know that this is a contentious idea, but it seems to me that at least to some degree, one's creativity needs to be in service to one side or the other of this battle where the lines have been drawn. It's a particular kind of fight. I mean, it's not a physical battle, although in the end it has physical consequences. It's a battle for momentum, a battle for winning the sense of what's inevitable or not, what's the world going to look like. And that battle is, well, that, that's everything. When I, without any idea what I was doing, got together with a few friends to start 350.org, um, we knew nothing. We had no idea how to organize, and probably just as well that we didn't, because perhaps otherwise, you know, myself and seven undergraduates would not have decided that organizing the world was a, a useful idea. Um, but we didn't know that, and so, since there were seven undergraduates, and since there are seven continents, each one took one, and we set out and went to work. And with whatever bit of beginner's luck, it actually kind of succeeded. Um, um, at least we've been able to organize all over the world. Um, our first big day of action in 2009, there were 5,200 rallies in 181 countries. And one of the things that we knew was that as we built this movement, um, words were not going to be our main weapon. Because among other things, we were working all over the world in places where people spoke all different languages. And that's why a number was so important. Um, this scientific data point, 350 parts per million CO2. And we knew also almost um, well, we knew it was another one of these kind of blessings of timing. We knew more than anything that um, pictures would be the way that we were able to communicate. Flickr was our killer app. If it hadn't existed, we might not have been able, this was a little before Facebook and long before, in generations before Instagram. Um, 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 we had people from all those rallies upload pictures of them immediately. They'd all done beautiful things, usually involving hundreds of bodies forming these numbers and things all over the world against the most amazing backdrops. And we had people upload them immediately so that we could share them all over the world, project them on those giant jumbotrons in Times Square. 
What we wanted was to allow people to see themselves as part of something large because I'd always thought that the biggest problem with climate change was simply that it seemed so big in relation to each one of us that it was very easy to give up to think that it was impossible for any of us to have any effect. And so instead it was necessary to begin to kind of try and conjure into being some sense of largeness, of humanity rising up. If we told people then to come to New York for a march, we wouldn't have gotten very many people, and we would have looked small. But instead, spread out around the world, it began to look large. And it's not just 350. There's so many other people now doing this work everywhere. Um, um, you get a sense of it from reading Rebecca's amazing writing about this, her most recent piece, go Google it in the nation. I so recommend this sense of uh, what I've called the kind of fossil fuel resistance now spreading in every direction around the world, almost as sprawling and protean in its form as the fossil fuel industry itself. Um, and as that resistance rises, this sense of inevitability begins to change in many, many, many ways. Um, in a fight like that, each, and here's maybe the crucial word for me for this talk, in a fight like that, each gesture becomes essential. There's a kind of um, fight of gestures, of images that are brought forward. And, and, and each time a gesture is made, each time, well, each time there's a new solar rooftop, that's the kind of easy and obvious one, but each time there's a divested college or even a strong, beautiful movement for it on a college, um, um, that sense of what's going to happen begins to shift. There's an almost mathematical sense of, 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 of gestures piling up on one side or the other, giving strength to one side or the other. Within these fights, within the kind of individual battles of which hundreds rage around the world now. There are beautiful gestures themselves that make a huge difference. Winona LaDuke, who was, um, who's been such a, such a leader in so many ways, one of the things that her community did that was the most beautiful of gestures and most generous of gestures the indigenous people on both sides of the border uh, in this continent have emerged in the last two or three years as the, just the absolute um, um, vanguard of this fight, and it's been beautiful to see it happen. But when they came last spring to Washington um, with ranchers and farmers from Nebraska and elsewhere, and when they joined together, put teepees down in the mall and spent a week there and rode on horseback to the White House and stuff. When they did that and when they called themselves the CIA, the Cowboy Indian Alliance, okay, think about what a gesture that represented. Think about what a generous thing it was for those native communities to be willing to make that common cause with people who after all had taken their land. Um, um, we're on top of it now. Um, 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 think of the power of that gesture with the sort of two of the great romantic um, um, forces in American history, no longer in opposition, but together. We're getting ready to do um, a week of divestment action up at Harvard. Um, uh, in next month um, uh, because, you know, Harvard's its own kind of symbol of much of what's not going quite right with the world. And um, I've been trying to think of sort of funny gestures to draw that home, you know. We're going to make sure that the um, 
uh, Harvard crew team has a shell up in the yard one day to demonstrate, you know, where you're going to be able to row in 50 or 60 years, you know, in Cambridge. Um, 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 we were going to have a, um, you know how they have at the baseball game? Uh, the mascots come out and have a race, you know, uh, uh, here in Washington, don't they have the presidents come out and race each other? Well, we're going to have, uh, we're going to get the, um, we're going to get the Stanford Cardinal, you know, and the, um, he's not going to win. The winner is going to be the, the mascot from uh, the University of the Marshall Islands um, down there in the South Pacific, two or three feet above sea level that divested last year. But the Harvard, the Harvard mascot that I think is going to come in third is the, you know, the almighty dollar. Um, uh, we're going to dress him up and run him around. Um, 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 the most beautiful and eloquent gesture of last year came the same week that we were, many of us in New York for that great climate march. Our friends in the Pacific, um, one of the things that that matters, been, mattered most to me in this fight is trying to give a voice to people in places that don't normally get it in our culture and uh, no place more emblematic of that than the small island states that are disappearing around the planet as the sea level rises. And they've been amazing organizers and what they did last fall was amazing on 10 or 12 islands, including Vanuatu that was all but washed away last week in the second biggest storm ever recorded in the South Pacific, uh, the biggest being Haiyan the year before in the Philippines. Um, um, they, um, in all those islands, they cut down um, trees and made traditional canoes. Uh, and then they took those canoes with much blessing and ceremony and things. They took them to Australia, to Newcastle, to the largest coal port in the world. And they used them for a day to blockade that coal port. And I wish I could show you the images of those amazing warriors um, in those canoes, hemming in some of the biggest ore ships on earth, holding them back. It was remarkable to see. And one of the groups of people who saw it included the, the people there in that part of Australia who a few months later, at least with some, partly as a consequence, voted out of office, the conservative uh, government of Queensland, um, blocking, we think, we hope, for the time being anyway, plans for the world's largest coal mine in the Galilee Valley of Australia. That mine's not going to get built. We are going to stop it, just like we're going to stop the tar sands from being <laughs> developed now. All the most eloquent gestures have come from the people most affected um, by all of this, who aren't us, they're people in the poorest places on the planet because they lack the margin um, to be resilient in the same kinds of ways. The thing about proper gestures, good gestures, which are beautiful artistic moments, is that you see behind them powerful truths. You get a wonderful example of this at the moment, watching Pope Francis uh, at work. Okay. Now, we're very hopeful that his encyclical on the environment will be good and eloquent, and I have no doubt that it will be, but equally as important, if not more important, have been the series of gestures with which his papacy has um, um, unfolded. Kneeling down to kiss the feet of prisoners at the uh, um, first Monday, Thursday service, um, 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 out among the poor as much as he can be, um, with a series of gestures helping people rediscover some sense of solidarity with the rest of the world. The Pope, because he has a spotlight on him, is capable of great gestures. There are others who, because of their station, have the ability to make sort of gestures like that that are felt everywhere. The most important moment 
in the divestment campaign so far has come from the most unlikely source. It was when the Rockefeller family announced that they thought it was no longer prudent nor moral to hold their investments in coal and oil and gas simply by the fact that they were heirs to the greatest fossil fuel fortune on earth. They were able to, with enormous power, make their point. But all of us have the ability to do those kind of things, to figure out how to make gestures loud enough and eloquent enough to be heard. It will be a great moment when Georgetown decides to divest because Georgetown, Georgetown rightly carries with it a prestige and a history reflected in this um, august room in which we find ourselves here. Um, 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 and that will be very good. The battle in the end, in this case, is for control of the zeitgeist, for control of how we think about the world, okay? Uh, our sense of what is going to happen. And the other side understands that exquisitely. It's why the fossil fuel industry spends all their time trying to promote the inevitability of continuing down the current path somewhat farther. Uh, it's why when Exxon addresses this issue, they talk on and on and on about how um, 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 ludicrous it would be to think that we were going to power the world with fossil fuel, their late, uh, with renewable energy, their latest estimate is that 4% of our energy will come from renewables by 2050. Well, the good news is we've blown past those numbers already in 2015. In fact, we're exceeding everybody's estimate. There was this chart yesterday about the spread of renewable energy and about what how well people had guessed about what it would, where we'd be at this point and there were 10 forecasts that they'd found from the International Energy Agency and things about where we'd be in 2015 and all of them were ludicrously low. The only one that came anywhere close to reality was Greenpeace's ideal scenario and even that had been too conservative but the fossil fuel companies insist on this. I know it, um, I know it myself because uh, a bunch of them um, got together right before Global Divestment Day in February and used some, as they say, dark money uh, to put out a video that went all around. Um, um, and it was a remarkable thing to watch. I hope you all, we, it's been seen four or 500,000 times on YouTube, but mostly I think because we sent it out to everybody. We wanted everyone to see it because it encapsulated the worldview perfectly. And what it showed was a young a college boy uh, in love, literally, not figuratively, literally in love with a barrel of oil who would <laughs> bat her eyelashes at him and things. And, but then his, um, um, you know, his uh, 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 goofy friends um, uh, persuaded him to break up with fossil fuels and when he did, his world went uh, uh, astray and he couldn't eat anymore and he, worse, he couldn't use his cell phone and, and it was, you know, all was terrible. And at a certain point, a kind of demon cartoon head of me appeared in the thing to do all this and whatever. And, and, and the point of the thing was this effort to say, you can't have a life if we don't have fossil fuel. Be scared, be very scared. Um, not scared of the Arctic melting, not scared of desert spreading, not scared scared that we might have to switch energy sources, okay? That we might have to substitute the sun for coal. Um, when you start to win that battle of gestures, then you start to win deeper battles. So, you know, we've been fighting this Keystone Pipeline now for years, and. Sometimes people say, oh, it's not so important, you know, there's many things you could be fighting. And, and of course, there are many things we are fighting. The only one that the newspapers write about is Keystone because it got caught up with 
presidential politics and the main thing that journalism anymore can even remember is important is presidential elections. But at any rate, it's been a great fight. We don't know how it'll come out and we continue to fight it. But, but even the fight so far, and I think Rebecca really pointed this out powerfully, um, has had remarkable effect. It's had direct physical effect up there in the tar sands where long before the price of oil began to fall, people pulled $17 billion in new investment off the table. Our brothers and sisters in the Cree and other indigenous communities up there won huge fights because those three big new mines aren't ever gonna be built and the rest of us won that fight because that was the equivalent of 700 new coal-fired power plants full of carbon. That's good. Um, um, that kind of thing is very real and it's happening everywhere. It's getting harder than heck to find new investors to invest in this kind of nonsense because they're beginning to worry that they won't be able to get their pipelines or their ports or whatever the hell it is that they're going to need. That fight helped spur other people to fight everything all over the place, which is as it should be. For the moment, we cannot get a carbon tax through Congress because Congress is owned by the fossil fuel industry. The Koch brothers have announced they're gonna spend more money on the next election than the Republican Party or the Democratic Party. They're gonna spend, you know, party of two, they're gonna spend $900 million, okay? So don't expect a carbon tax right away out of Congress. That means that we're gonna to have to be, as Naomi Klein said, the carbon tax ourselves, okay? We're gonna to have to impose that tax in all the ways that we can by making it difficult for business as usual to go on. And when we break their power some, then we'll get some kind of carbon tax, you know? They'll start to sue for peace and we'll see what happens. But in the meantime, that's our job. Their job is to make the status quo seem inevitable. Our job is to make the future, the change, seem inevitable and possible and to get there. Creativity is the absolute most important thing in this fight. What we did at 350 was, I think, kind of the opposite of what environmental and other groups have sort of traditionally done, we called it what we were doing open source organizing and just said to everybody, take this logo, take this number, take this idea and do with it what you will with the opposite of intellectual property. You guys are better able than we are in every country on earth to understand how to make sense of this in your time and your place. And so with things like the divestment movement, where everybody knows in their own place how best to do it. I'm on my way to Swarthmore tomorrow where 43 students have been occupying the president's office for a couple of weeks. And um, um, they, they lean hard on the fact that theirs is a Quaker institution with a particular heritage and there's a particular set of arguments and in this institution you guys have done a wonderful job of understanding that one of the things that appeals deeply to the Jesuit imagination is this notion of social justice that it is and that it is at the absolute heart of the work that must be done as Desmond Tutu said this is the greatest human rights crisis of our time when he helped launch this divestment campaign um sometimes sometimes at the very end and I really will end here um, 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 I can take a hint. Um, um, we have to, um, we even have to use our bodies as the kind of um, images and gestures and works of art that they can be. Um, the Swarthmore thing is a beautiful example and I will take your good wishes on to them, you know. Um, I remember, I mean, I'm the furthest thing, I, I, as I say, I don't know anything about organizing. I'm not a professional organizer. That's not where I came from. I don't, but, but I remember 
at the beginning of the Keystone fight, when I, I wrote the letter that asked people to come to Washington and get arrested, which was uh, it's not an easy kind of letter to write. I mean, it wasn't for me because I take that sort of thing seriously. Um, I mean, my bias is to be law-abiding, I gotta say. Um, 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 and, um, uh, but it was beautiful to see what happened, to see that this was, you know, that Gandhi and King were right about the incredible power sometimes of nonviolent moral witness. We don't have to do it all the time. It's not the main tool or the only tool in our toolbox. There are those things that people like Mike Tidwell or Betsy Taylor or whatever are so good at all the time of figuring out how to make use of the levers of power and the things and the possibilities, okay? But there are times when one has no choice. Um, um, and then, boy, it worked the way that, that Gandhi and Dr. King and people said maybe it sometimes could, that it underlined the moral seriousness of something, that it ra we were going to lose, there was no way we were going to win this fight. The National Journal, the kind of insider paper here in D.C., had polled its 300 energy experts in the summer of 2011 and all the people on the Hill and then K Street and things, and 91% of them said that TransCanada would have its permit by the end of 2011 to build the Keystone Pipeline. It was as done a deal as ever a deal was until 1,200 and some people went to jail, which was more people that had gone to jail about anything for a long time, and then it started coming undone, and it gave us the room to then go work in all kinds of other ways in order to, who knows what's going to happen, but maybe, maybe to, to, to even win this. I don't even want to say it. I'm too superstitious. Um, 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 thank you, Betsy. Um, um, there were a couple of things, a couple of gestures that weren't necessary and they don't need to be repeated and whatever, but that were at that point useful. One of them was, I, when I was writing that letter, I was very conscious that I did not want young people to have to be the main cannon fodder here, okay? Young people lead this fight most of the time in most of places in most ways and that's good. But really, though many of them are willing and have been, it's not, for me, uh, it does not do my heart good to see them getting arrested all the time because in the world in which we live, if you're 22 and you're sending out your resume and whatever, and then probably an arrest record is not the single best thing on it, you know? Um, um, one of the few unmixed blessings of growing older is past a certain point, what the hell are they going to do to you, you know? And so it was, um, it was with pleasure that we watched a lot of people with, you know, hair that looked like mine kind of arrive. Um, um, some of you who were here will, who got arrested, you'll remember, we didn't actually ask people how old they were because that would be rude, but we did say, I think cleverly, who was president when you were born? Um, and the two biggest cohorts were from um, the FDR and the Truman administrations. And on the last day, there was a guy arrested with a sign around his neck that said, World War II vet handle with care. Um, um, those were beautiful gestures. We also said to people, by the way, I just, on that theme, since we're at a college, if there's anybody here who happens to have tenure, you know, everything I've said goes triple for you, okay? Uh, 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 you're literally the most untouchable people in the entire world, okay? So make some use of it, all right? Um, 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 we also said to people, and this was odd too, um, um, if you come, come to get arrested, wear a necktie or a dress. Now, I rarely wear a necktie, you know. I live in Vermont, we, but you know. Um, um, but now I, when I come to Washington, I wear one just in case I'm gonna get arrested. Um, 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 not because we like, because we were trying to make a visual point. And it's the really important point that I've been trying to make all day. One of the things that undergirds what I've been trying to say. 
which is that in the deepest sense, there's nothing radical about what we're talking about. We're talking about uh, 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 keeping the world physically looking something like the way that it did. We're talking about following the advice of scientists and engineers about how to proceed. We're talking about those aren't particularly radical gestures in some odd sense, they're conservative ones. Radicals work at oil companies. If you are willing to get up in the morning and alter the chemical composition of the atmosphere, even once scientists have told you what to do, if you are willing to watch the Arctic melt and then stand in line for licenses to go drill in the newly opened waters of the Arctic, then you are radicals on a scale that human beings have never seen before. And our job becomes to check that radicalism and check it fast. I, I finish simply by saying um, that I've got no idea whether we're actually going to win this battle or not. Okay. Um, we waited a very long time to get started. Uh, the momentum of climate change is extremely strong. Uh, there was a paper yesterday about how the rapid influx of fresh water melting off Greenland is beginning to do weird things to the salinity of the North Atlantic and play havoc with the Gulf Stream. That's bad news. There's bad news every day about this bad, deeply unsettling news. I don't know if we're going to get it done in time, but I do know that thanks to folks like y'all, we're going to fight. We're going to make a fight of it. And, and I, know, I know that thanks to folks like y'all, that fight's going to be beautiful and creative and filled with all the parts of the human spirit that in the end are the things that we're trying hardest to defend. I mean, uh, at some level, the planet, the planet will go on and our job is not to save it, it will save itself. Our, job is to keep from wrecking the lives of the poorest people on earth and our job is also to prove that the big brain was a good idea, you know, or that it was connected to a big enough heart to get us out of the trouble that it was capable of getting us into. It will be a very interesting time finding out about that and it will be known in the lifetime of everybody in this room and we all have an enormous part to play. One of the most beautiful things about this movement is that it comes without real leaders, you know. Um, um, maybe it'd be good if we had a Dr. King, but we don't. And so in, instead, we have this beautiful spread out network of people all over the place who are in enough communion and enough connection to be together and, and fighting shoulder to shoulder, where I'm really proud to be with you all. Thank you. Mm.